Life Science Learners to another installment. I trust that you guys are well. Today we're focusing on mutations and we're trying to understand what genetic profiling is. If we recollect, in the previous lessons we've looked at DNA, we've looked at protein synthesis. Today we're looking at genetic mutations. You might have heard of the term mutations. How do they occur? That's interesting. The significance of mutations, also very interesting. So let's try and understand the context of all of that in our lesson today. Very interesting question as we start off. And I'd like to pose this question to you all. Can mutations be helpful or harmful? So we often refer to mutations and we think, well, a mutation is harmful, it could be really uh, damaging to you. Have we ever wondered whether mutations can be beneficial or helpful? And the other question is, do we have mutations? And I'll leave that question with you and I'll try and probably attempt that at the end to answer that. So, as an overview, we're going to spend some time looking at some important terminology. We're going to try and unpack what a mutation is. Important to us is understanding the types of mutations and we will spend some time in the segment looking at what is it that causes mutations. So some key words, again, a recap of the word gene, and we know that genes are genetic sequences that code for characteristic. So if we talk about a mutation, we refer to a change in the gene sequence. So that's important to have context to the word gene. We also know that there are sometimes there's changes in the chromosomes of an organism, and so we're going to point to the process of a mutation happening on a chromosome. We need to unpack what a mutation is. We're going to look at factors that cause mutations and refer to those factors as mutagens. During our process of understanding genetic profiling, we're going to look at the concept of what coding DNA is and non-coding DNA. It's important for us to understand what DNA profiling is and its uses. And during that process of DNA profiling, we're going to refer to the abbreviation STRs and try and understand what short tandem repeat sequences are. We're going to look at the use of restriction enzymes in the process of DNA profiling. A concept that will be elaborated on during the lesson would be PCR, which is essentially a process of copying the DNA. And then we're going to look at the process of electrophoresis, which is using some form of electrical charge to separate out molecules. Okay, so let's get straight into trying to understand what is a mutation. A mutation is a permanent change in the DNA sequence of a gene. Let's try and understand that again. So it is a change in the sequence of a gene. Okay? Mutations in a gene sequence can alter the amino acid sequence of the protein encoded by the gene. Mutations can occur spontaneously, meaning very unpredicted, can happen at any time in all living organisms. However, we need to understand that not all mutations are inherited. Only those that occur in the sex organs during gametogenesis, which is a formation of gametes, can be inherited. So let's pause at this and try and understand the context of what mutations are. So as I mentioned, that mutations are a change in the sequence of a gene. And so if we think of what a gene is, a gene is made up of a sequence of nucleotides coded by a specific number of nitrogenous bases. These mutations mean that there has been an alteration or a change in that sequence. And so if we recollect that a gene codes for a characteristic, if we change a, a sequence of a nucleotide, it could in turn affect the mRNA that is produced. And so we say that that could in turn affect the mRNA sequence. And if you recollect, mRNAs contain codons, which are short free bases that code for an amino acid. So if there is a change in the nucle nucleotide sequence of DNA, that could affect an amino acid sequence, and that in turn could have an effect on the protein that's being produced. And so we say 
that there is a change or an alteration of the genetic makeup. What is also important to recognize is that mutations occur spontaneously, meaning that these cannot be predicted. They can come up now and then without necessarily having some predictive nature around them. So they're spontaneous. What is also important is that we noted that mutations are inherited. That means they're passed on from one generation to the next or from one cell to the next. And this can only happen if it occurs in what we refer to as the gametes. And those gametes are the, the sex cells, so it's the sperm cells and the egg cells. And that happens during the process of gametogenesis. Cool. So where and when do mutations occur? So as we said that mutations are spontaneous, they do occur very unpredictably. However, mutation is fundamentally a mistake. And these mistakes occur, one, when DNA is copied. And as a result of the environmental factors such as UV light or even using a certain, nicot uh, certain substances like smoking. Mutations can occur during DNA replication if errors are made and are not corrected in time. So guys, if we try and understand what DNA replication is, DNA replication is the process of copying DNA. And if you go back to understanding that we, we spoke about different models of replication, where the DNA was copied, and one model that we refer to is the semi-conservative model, where at the end we have two new strands having half old and half new strands of DNA in them. And so because of the rate at which DNA replication occur, we know that at some point mistakes do happen. The mechanism of DNA replication has a corrective process which corrects any mistakes that happen. However, some mistakes do go by without being picked up. And often when a mistake hasn't been corrected, we say that that alters the, the, the genetic information in the next uh, cell or the next generation. And we say that that is now an inherited mutation which has not been corrected. So mutations may involve anything from a single base being changed to an entire chromosome. And that takes us to the next concept. Mutations can occur in somatic cells. So these are your cells in the body, excluding the sperms and the eggs. And this can occur during meiosis and mitosis. So let me rephrase that again. It can occur in mitosis as well as in meiosis. And this is during, as I mentioned, gametogenesis. Broadly speaking, there are two types of mutations. I refer to them as chromosomal mutations and gene mutations. Let's try and understand the difference between chromosomes and genes. Remember that in the nucleus, we've got chromatin network. And that chromatin network consists of strands of DNA. When the cell prepares for cell division, it will arrange the genetic information or the DNA into compact structures called chromosomes. We also know that a chromosome consists of many genes. So on the DNA, we have long segments of genetic information broken up into genes. So when we refer to a chromosome mutation, it's important that we recognize that that's a chromosome or that's a chromatid. When we refer to a gene mutation, it's important that we recognize that that's a sequence of DNA and if a sequence of DNA has a single change in a, at a specific point, then we refer to that as a change in the gene referred to as a genetic mutation or a gene mutation. So let's try and unpack chromosome mutations first. Let's try and understand what a chromosome is. So any change in the structure or the number of chromosomes is referred to as a chromosomal mutation. So if we have a chromosome, and if there's a change in that structure where a piece of that chromosome is broken up and lost, we can refer to that as a chromosomal abnormality or aberration. So there's a, a piece that has been lost. That's an abnormality that has occurred. That's a gene mutation. We know that some individuals may produce a gamete 
that has an extra set of chromosomes. And when that gamete fuses, we end up with an individual having a three or a triploid set of chromosomes for a specific chromosome. So we refer to that as, again, a chromosomal abnormalities. It's important for us to recognize that chromosomal mutations occur at a large scale, which means that there are several genes that are affected. If we try and unpack this and refer to this chromosome, it consists of many genes. And so if we have a chromosomal mutation, it could affect more than one gene. And so we say that the effect is significantly larger because chromosomes contain many genes. Chromosomal mutations are sometimes referred to as chromosomal aberrations. And the word aberrations essentially points to, uh, points to the word mistakes or changes. So when we look at chromosomal mutations, we know that there are certain environmental factors such as radiation, ultraviolet, nuclear radiation, some chemicals, and even viruses that can cause chromosomal mutations or chromosomes to break. So we refer to that as environmental factors or mutagens. If the broken ends do not rejoin the same pattern, this will cause a change in the chromosomal structure and we refer to this as a chromosomal aberration. There are several different types of chromosomal mutations. At this point, let's try and recognize what this means. A deletion of a chromosome would mean that a chromosome has been omitted from the gamete. We often see in certain conditions like Down syndrome, we see a duplication of a chromosome. So a Down syndrome individual will have, a normal individual has two sets of chromosomes for each pair. However, when we look at a Down syndrome individual, they would have a chromosome that has been in a triploid set. So it's trisomy, and that's because one of the gametes had a duplicate number of chromosomes, number 21. We sometimes see the inversion of a chromosome, which essentially is a segment of a chromosome, I'm gonna use that, this illustration, breaking away and being inverted or swapped its position around. So we say that there's an inversion or the turning around of a segment of that chromosome. The word translocation refers to changing the position. And translocation essentially refers to when a chromosome arm breaks off and then moves and reattaches onto a different chromosome. And we see now an attachment of a different chromosome onto an unrelated pair chromosome. So we refer to that as transferring or changing the position of a chromosome. We also know that in some processes, like during meiosis, there is a process of non-disjunction, which essentially refers to the non-separation of chromosomes during anaphase. And so when we refer to anaphase one and two, we know that these chromosomes are pulled apart, or we see the separation of chromatids apart. However, the term non-disjunction refers to when an entire pair of chromosome is pulled to the one pole, or when an entire chromosome is pulled to the one pole, as opposed to splitting up into chromatids and being pulled to the opposite ends. So we refer to that as non-disjunction. And we, we do recognize that this process creates chromosomal mutation. So as a wrap of this segment, let's try and review what chromosomal mutations are. So I mentioned that they could be the relocation of genetic material, and that can occur through translocation or inversion. And in this image, we're seeing a specific sequence where that's the gene, or if we kind of focus on an area of that segment, we're seeing that now we're seeing a segment from another chromosome being added on here, so that's changing its location. In this image, we're seeing that there's been a swap between that chromosome in that chromosome where a segment of that chromosome has been changed in its position, which I've referred to in this diagram here. We sometimes see that there's a duplication of a segment of a chromosome, as you would see here. There are two sets of the original chromosome, so that's duplicated. Or 
as I mentioned, in the case of a duplication of the entire chromosome, where we see two sets of one chromosome, which is different to the normal one set per gamete, or we could see that there is a loss of genetic material where an entire chromosome has not separated and you end up with a gamete that misses or lacks a specific chromosome. We also know that the, there could be a deletion of a segment of a chromosome which we see absent in this specific chromosome. So guys, we've spent some time looking at the process of how chromosome mutations take place. We're going to get back and we're going to spend some time looking at gene mutations and what happens during genetic mutations and the effects of those mutations. You guys have done well. You need a little break, stretch, come back in a bit, and we'll join you for a good interactive session looking at the effects of mutations. Welcome back, Life Science Learners, to our second installment for today. We've looked at the process of what chromosomal mutations are. A reminder that we are looking at mutations today. In this segment, we're going to focus on what a gene mutation is. We're going to try and understand how this occurs, what are the factors that cause these mutations, and we're going to look at the possible effects of these mutations. So it's important that we recognize that gene mutations occur at a smaller scale when compared to a chromosomal mutation. This means that a gene mutation could affect one gene or a few genes. In comparison, when we looked at a chromosome, it meant that a chromosome has several genes on it. So the effect of that would be significantly more. What's important for us to recognize is that a gene mutation is a change in the sequence of the nucleotides in a gene. So if we go back to understanding what a gene is, it's basically a sequence of DNA nucleotides. So when a nucleotide or a base is added or is missing or changed, we say that that is a gene mutation. So it's important that we recognize that when we look at genes, a gene codes for a protein, and that happens through the mRNA being trans transcribed and then translated into a protein. However, when there is a change in the gene sequence, we often end up with an mRNA that has an abnormality or an, an altered sequence. And that will then translate into what we refer to either an abnormal protein or a protein that is not produced. And so we see now the effect of a mutation where the protein sequence has been altered. It's important that we recognize that there are certain factors that cause mutations, and we refer to those factors as mutagens. So any factor that causes a mutation is referred to as a mutagen. And so there are several different types of factors that cause muta mutations. So mutations can occur spontaneously, which means very unpredictably, they can suddenly develop, and that's often because of the rapid rate of replication. We also know that there are certain environmental factors that can trigger these changes in the DNA. We know that there are certain ultraviolet lights that can be linked to the change in the sequence of nucleotides. X-rays and UV radiation can also result in changes in DNA sequences. We also find that there are chemicals, example, benzene, formal aldehyde, and carbon tetrachloride that are all linked to be uh, known as mutagens or uh, mutation-causing agents. So we refer to those agents collectively as mutagens. So guys, a very good infographic on the various possible types of radiation or mutations we have. We know that we often tend to sunbathe or bask in the sun, and that sun radiation produces certain harmful ultraviolet radiations that can cause certain changes in our skin cells, and that can alter the sequence of cells, leading to cells dividing and growing uncontrollably, and we refer to that as cancer. 
we know that certain X-ray machines produce large number of um, you know, X-rays that can obviously penetrate deep into our cells, especially our cells that are actively dividing and alter the genetic sequence of cells in there. Smoking cigarettes contain uh, lots of carcinogens or mutagen-causing chemicals, and these can alter our cells. We know that there are certain types of foods that contain carcinogenic or mutagenic substances. Certain products, as we said, chemicals can also be linked to muta mutations. Certain viruses and even bacteria can be linked to mutation uh, or mutation-causing uh, agents. One example of that is the HPV virus, which is linked to the initiation of mutations in your cervical cells. And so there's a, there's a concern around HPV um, infections and the link that that has to uh, in the initiation of cancer in certain cells. So guys, let's try and unpack what gene mutations are. So when we unpack what gene mutations are, it's important that we recognize that there are different types of gene mutations. And I'll broadly classify them into two groups, a point mutation and a frame shift mutation. At this point, let's try and understand the difference between the two. When we refer to a point mutation, it refers to a change at a single point, and that could include a nucleotide that has been altered, removed, or substituted. However, we also know that there are frame shift mutations, which then could change the length of the gene. So let's try and differentiate between the two and see the examples of these and the effects that they have. So a point mutation refers to a change in a single nucleotide in a gene. This may include a type called substitution. And so guys, the word substitution refers to a change. So think of when you're at school and you've got a substitute teacher coming into your class. It means there's a different teacher coming in, not the usual. So sometimes during DNA replication, we have accidentally a substitute nucleotide put into that sequence. And that changes the meaning, it changes the sequence present. And so we refer to that as a substitution. So this is a gene mutation where one nitrogenous base is replaced, again substituted, by another. And this may result, and the word may result, in an alteration of just one amino acid. And hence we refer to that as a point mutation. So if we try and unpack an example of that point mutation, so what I've illustrated in this table is a sequence of DNA as you would look up here. That's a sequence of DNA which I'm outlining in red. And so that sequence of DNA during the process of protein synthesis produces an mRNA codon or mRNA sequence. That mRNA sequence in turn is then translated into an amino acid chain. So when we look at this DNA sequence produces a chain of methionine, lysine, leucine, alanine, and cysteine. However, if we subject or if we notice that there has been a point mutation, this would mean that on the mutated DNA strand that there would be a single nucleotide that has been affected. In the case of substitution, which is this example, we see that there has been a change or a substitute in the adenine nucleotide at this specific gene. And so we see that the G nucleotide has been substituted for an adenine. So here is a substitution that has occurred. So what does this mean now when we look at the mRNA sequence? It means that that DNA, when it's transcribed, now produces an mRNA that reads GUC. If we compare that to the original mRNA, which was a GCC, it means that now the amino acid in turn will be changed. So we had the original amino acid at that specific position called alanine with the effect of substitution where a single point mutation has occurred. We see that the amino acid at that specific point is now valine. And so in this case, the effect of 
and a, a mutation has resulted in the amino acid being altered because of a single nucleotide chain. And so we'll discuss the effects of that in a little while. We also know that there's a, a different type of point mutation called an inversion. So what does an inversion mean? An inversion essentially is a, a mutation where one or more bases in a triplet are inverted. So the word invert is to swap around. So I'll point that out in an example. This may result in the alteration of one or more amino acids. Let's try and understand that by using an example. So again, here's the sequence that we're looking at, and here's the inversion of that sequence. So essentially, the GAA has been inverted, and you see that it's now an AGG. What does this mean to the mRNA? When we look at the original mRNA, GAA coded for CUU. However, with the effect of the inversion, AAG now codes for an, a codon called UUC. What is the impact that it has now on the amino acid? The original amino acid for that specific codon was leucine. We now see that it is changed to an amino acid called phenylalanine. Again, the result of this means that there's been a change, not just in the DNA sequence, but also a change in the amino acid sequence. What does this mean to the protein? This is a change in the structure of the protein. We know that proteins are defined by the specific sequence of amino acids. What will this mean to the protein? We'll have to unpack that when we look at the effects of these mutations. When we look at the other group of mutations, we refer to them as frame shift mutations. Just to recap, we're discussing point mutations. And in point mutations, we said that there were different types and we looked at, we looked at a single base being inserted or substituted. Now we're looking at the next group, which is frame shift. So let's try and understand the different types of frame shift mutations. Again, the word frame shift refers to changing the length of the line. Now, a simple example of this would be, think of when you type in a specific sentence on your phone when you're texting someone. And often we make a mistake and we kind of add in an extra letter. And so that changes the length of your sentence. Or if we delete a word, it decreases the length of a sentence. So, so the impact that the frame shift mutation has is that it either changes the length of the gene, either by increasing it or decreases the length. And that can happen through either a deletion or, as I'm going to mention in the next slide, an insertion. Let's go back to deletion. So what does deletion mean? Deletion essentially refers to the omission, the removal. So as you would get the delete button on your keyboard, it means removing something. Sometimes a mutation results in a piece of a nuclear, a piece of DNA losing a nucleotide. Now, as I mentioned, let's try and identify the impact that it has on the original DNA. So here's the original DNA. It has a sequence of TAC, and that will transcribe into AUG. That in turn means that if a mutation took place, and let's look at what the mutation was here, here we're seeing that the mutation took place where C was deleted. So this means that we now have a shift in the thymine from the next set of um, codons onto the DNA. So when the effect of that mutation is seen is when the result of the codon, in this case AUG, has now changed to AUA. And what that in turn translates to is that the amino acid, which originally was meant to be methionine, has now changed to an amino acid called isoleucine. And we refer to this, again, as a frame shift mutation. We call, because we, if we look at further down at the end of that sequence, we see that now there is a sequence, there is a sequence that lacks a nucleotide. And this missing nucleotide has resulted in 
also an amino acid that is not produced in that sequence. So we have the effect of isoleucine being a new amino acid, but we also see that the chain lacks an amino acid. So the effect of that is significantly uh, distinct. So insertion essentially refers to adding on or inserting. A gene mutation where one or more nitrogenous base is inserted or added on will result in a frame shift. Again, if we had a length of a gene and if we decide to add on into this, it's going to lengthen or increase the size of that gene. And so we refer to that having a shifting effect on the size of that gene. So after insertion, we find that all the base triplets are altered and consequently, the amino acid sequence is changed. And if we, to, if we were to look at that, we see in this specific sequence, we seeing that there is an insertion of a nucleotide here. And that insertion in turn has an effect on the mRNA sequence and lysine has now been replaced with glutamic acid and we see the effect of the entire chain of amino acids being altered. And often you end up having an odd nucleotide and in this case uh, as an amino acid plus an extra, extra nucleotide that hasn't been coded for. And so when we look at this, this is the effect of insertion. So guys, we've looked at the effect of insertion deletion as frame shift mutations. We've looked at substitution as well as a point mutation. What's very important for us to look at next is the effect of these mutations on the protein and how that affect characteristics of individuals. If you guys have done what, well, let's have a short break and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back, life science learners, to our final segment for today. We've looked at types of mutations, we've looked at chromosomal mutations, we've looked at gene mutations. In gene mutations, we've looked at point and frame shift. Now we're going to try and understand what does the effect of these mutations have on the amino acid sequence. So when we talk of effects of gene mutations, we often refer to the effect that it has on the protein. So mutations may have very different and varied effects. This depends on several factors. One needs to look at the effect that it has on the protein that is produced, as well as the impact that it has on the type of protein and the nature of that protein. Often, if that protein is an important protein that's involved in important cellular processes, it means that that protein now does not carry out an important function. Sometimes we see that certain mutations may occur but not have a significant Im impact on the individual. When we started the segment, I mentioned that you know that there are mutations that occur. And, and I asked the question about, am I full of mutations? Do we have mutations? Yes, we do. The fact that I'm left-handed means that there has been a mutation that has altered the sequence of the gene that gives me uh, the ability to be able to use a recessive uh, a gene, which is in my case, left-handedness. In terms of the color of my skin, my hair, um, the, the ability of me to be able to roll my thumb, the ability of the hitchhiker's thumb. Those are characteristics that are all as a result of variation. So what is important that we recognize is that mutations result in changes in the gene, but more than that, that is what produces variation in a population. So when you look around in your class, and if you look at a, your family, you will see that we all are different, yet we have the same set of parents. And that's about the effect that mutations and genetic recombination has. So let's remember that when we're looking at the effect of mutations. So thus, the effect of mutations can be categorized as follows. A neutral mutation, mutations that are harmful, sometimes lethal, and occasionally beneficial. Let's try and unpack what a neutral mutation is. The word neutral essentially refers to something that does not have an effect. So we refer to it as being harmless or in some context, a silent mutation. Some mutations can occur in the non-coding DNA and in thus do not affect the synthesis of protein. Also, several codons may code for one amino acid 
and hence a mutation may have no effect on the mutated codon, which at the end still produces the same amino acid. Thus, the sequence of the amino acids in the chain is not altered and we say that it still produces an unaltered protein. So we say that that's a neutral mutation as it has not affected the protein chain. However, we have harmful mutations and often these would be mutations that cause genetic disorders. Most of these disorders are autosomal recessive and I'll explain the concept what autosomal recessive is. And these can be passed down from one generation to the next. These mutations often affect an important protein molecule. An example of this would be albinism or even sickle cell anemia. So when we look at harmful, protein, harmful uh, mutations, we refer to these mutations as mutations that affect a specific gene. With the example of sickle cell anemia, we know that that's a mutation that alters a single amino acid. And the alteration or the change of a single amino acid affects the entire shape of the red blood cell. And so we see the impact of a single mutation impacting an entire protein sequence. We also know that albinism is a, is a mutation due to an alteration of a gene where the pigment that produces, the pigment which is melanin, which is produced to, pro to give skin color is lacking. And so this is the effect of what we refer to as point mutations causing a harmful effect on the individual. So if we were to look at, for example, sickle cell anemia, we see that this is the normal gene, and that normal gene which has been produced has a sequence of glutamic acid as the amino acid there. However, due to an alteration in the nucleotide sequence, a single base mu mutation alters the amino acid sequence where that specific amino acid now has changed to valine. And with the effect of that, it means that there's an abnormal hemoglobin molecule that is produced and which then in turn alters the shape of the red blood cell. When we look at the red blood cell, we can see it's got a healthy round shape, biconcave shape. However, these cells tend to be abnormally shaped and often described as sickle cell. And the problem with these cells is that they tend to clot up and stick together and do not pass through the capillaries whereas these cells easily flow. It also means that because of the abnormal shape, the ability of these cells to transport oxygen has been compromised and they transfer significantly less oxygen when compared to healthy, well-shaped red blood cells. We also know that there are mutations that can result in a beneficial protein. So this is when the environment in which an organism lives changes constantly and may lead to the emergence of a beneficial mutation. Mutations may cause genetic variation that could lead to natural selection. And the advantages of these are then passed on from one generation to the next. Having just looked at sickle cell anemia, and we know that that mutation can be harmful. However, in the context of the environment changing, when the environment changes and a mutation gives an individual a, ch a better chance at adapting to that environment, we say that natural selection has taken place. And so what drives the survival of the fittest on earth is the fact that some individuals are different to others based on variation. Where does that variation come from? It comes from the mutations. So mutations drive change. When that change gives an individual an advantage at surviving, they have a better chance of surviving. So with sickle cell anemia, we do know that individuals that are affected by sickle cell anemia are generally having problems in terms of the amount of oxygen being transported. However, when these individuals who live in areas that has a high prevalence of malaria, these individuals are not susceptible to being infected by the parasite that causes the malaria. Because the parasite that infects the host uses the red blood cell to make copies. And because of an abnormally shaped red blood cells, these individuals become naturally immune to being in affected by malaria. 
So we see that, that the environment, when it changes, for example, in this case, an environment which has a high uh, amount of exposure to the parasite from malaria, these individuals in that environment have a significant advantage. And we say that they're better suited because of the mutation. And that becomes a beneficial mutation to the individual. And finally, when we look at other examples of beneficial mutations, as I mentioned, there is an example of increased bone density. So individuals in, in the population in, in, in America, an individual was in met, met with an accident and they realized that when they tested his DNA and he walked out of an accident scene unscaled, un unhurt, and this showed that he had an abnormality in his gene makeup which produced a high density of bone tissue. And so that meant that that characteristic gave him an advantage. The other example we spoke about was malaria resistance in sickle cell anemia individuals. There's also a population in Italy that have a gene which has allowed them to be able to consume large amounts of cholesterol and yet not be affected by the effect of consuming that. So the protein has changed and that has allowed them to be able to process meat or diets high in cholesterol. So these are examples of ex mutations that are beneficial to the populations. So as we get into this, we need to unpack what DNA profiling is as our last segment in this lesson. DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling is a chemical test that shows the genetic makeup of a person or other living things. It is used as evidence in courts to identify bodies, to track down blood relatives, as well as to look at cures for disease. If we were to look at an overview of DNA profiling, it is very simply a process where a DNA sample is collected and that sample is treated with enzymes called restriction enzymes. And this allows for the DNA to be cut up into several different lengths of fragments. We then subject that DNA fragment to a treatment of um, electrophoresis. We know that electrophoresis is a technique that is used to separate out the DNA into fragments based on the size of their length. This is based on that DNA is negatively charged and that it would be separated due to the attraction it may have under an electric field. This is then subject to a process of electrophoresis, which is an apparatus that is used to separate out the gel. The DNA is then trapped in a gel, and that is then photographed to produce what we refer to as a DNA banding pattern. So the use of DNA fingerprint can be based on the fact that we all have a unique set of non-coding DNA. And in that non-coding DNA, we find that we are all having unique short tandem repeats. And these are short segments that constantly repeat. And that is what is used in identifying the similarities or differences between two samples of DNA that may be found at a crime scene or used to determine the relatedness between different individuals. Okay, uh, it's important that we know that it can also be used in medicine in terms of being able to identify genetic abnormalities of individuals. And the use of DNA fingerprinting has profound number of uses in terms of determining identity, determining relatedness, and it's currently even being used to track animals that have been poached, as well as plants that have been illegally transported or moved across from one place to another. So we can use DNA profiling in the conservation of plants and animals as well. So guys, if we look at a question, and I'm drawing back to a gene which is used in the tolerance of, um, to high cholesterol diet. So a village in Le Mans, in the northern shores of Lake Garda in Italy, has a population of about 980 inhabitants. About 40 villages have an extraordinary high level of blood cholesterol. 
Yet, upon examination, their arteries have found no harmful effects. Genetic tests show that they possess a genetic mutation in which they, they can produce an altered protein with just one amino acid that's different to the rest. And this, amino, uh, this altered protein gives them the ability to be able to process that. This improves their ability to be able to effectively clean up excess cholesterol. And this means that no matter how much of excess cholesterol they consume in their diet, that is always collected and disposed of from the blood. From the village records, it is discovered that all these carriers were related and descendants from one couple who arrived in this village in 1636. Generally, the people of Le Mans live longer and show a greater resistance to heart diseases. So this was a question that's based on the effect of a mutation. Explain what is meant by the term mutation. So guys, again, a mutation refers to a change in the sequence of a nucleotide. That's essentially what the context of today's lesson was. We've got to identify the type of mutation that was produced. And in this case, the mutation that was produced was a beneficial mutation. And the reason that happened was that it produced an altered protein that gave them the ability to be able to process extra cholesterol in their blood capillaries. And so that is seen as a significantly advantageous mutation. So guys, we've rushed through the segment. We've tried to look at DNA profiling. We've looked at the effects of mutations, and we've recognized that mutations can be beneficial, harmful, lethal, and even neutral. It's important that we understand that mutations drive variation in the population. And when we move on to evolution, we often refer to natural selection. And that natural selection is driven by the variation in the population. So to sum it up, mutations are important in a population because they create variation. And that variation is important to the species being able to adapt. So we've wrapped the segment up by looking at mutations. We've looked at the effect of mutations. And I hope that you guys go back and reflect on why mutations are important in a population and how they drive natural selection. Thank you for staying tuned. Wish you well. Keep well. Go safe.